Um, you know, it's funny because I've been getting a lot of jokes about this, uh, God shots, what does it mean? And uh, I, I thought that really it was kind of like a punchline uh, to a good lawyer joke. You know, like what you get when you cross spirituality with an attorney, God shots. Yeah, right. So uh, uh, anyway, um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you here. And I'd first like to start uh, with a little prayer. So if you join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We spend our lives building walls. Walls around ourselves. Walls around our hearts. We build walls that separate us from other people, from God's creation, and sometimes from God himself. We build these walls for many, many different and often painfully understandable reasons. In the 40 days of Lent, hopefully, we spent some time thinking about these disordered walls, why they were erected, and how they can be dismantled. Ideally, we spent some time applying the tools of human free will aided by God's grace to dismantle some of the walls during Lent. Yet even throughout our entire lives, as we built our walls high and thick, our Lord was constantly at work, constantly penetrating our walls. And that is what I'd like to talk to you about today. Now, you know that I'm an attorney, so I've got to get my caveats. <laughs> I uh, would beg your for forgiveness for my pedestrian approach today. I'm not a theologian, and I have not studied any sacred text of any religious tradition in depth. Uh, so I will uh, ask you to please humor me uh, in just simply reading to you a story. And since this is being watched, I'm sure my mentors at the DA's office are horrified that I would actually read a presentation uh, to members of the public. <laughs> but this is uh, an Easter story, and the title of the story is God Shots. About 10 years ago, there was a man who had it all. He was married to a beautiful woman. They had been college sweethearts and were very much in love. The man worked in a prestigious law office where he was up and coming and well respected. He and his wife were expecting their first child, a son. Being the only son of the only son of the only son for five generations, this son would carry on the family name. Life was perfect. When the man's son was born, he was premature and had a large tumor growing out of his neck. The man and his wife named their son Victor. Victor could not breathe and nothing could be done to help Victor. Victor lived for two minutes and died. Those who have lost a child can understand the deep, deep pain the couple felt. Not that it would have mattered which spiritual tradition he was raised with, the man had been a lapsed Catholic for over a decade. With nothing to fall back on, so began the man's plunge into his self-erected abyss. Over the next five years, the man lived with the dead. Through disordered choice and indifference, the man erected the highest walls he could build, while methodically burning everything inside of those walls. At home, he grew increasingly hostile towards his wife. At work, his anger manifested itself in thoughts of vengeance against anyone who might affront him. The birth of two daughters did nothing to alter his course. By the fifth year, he lived like a single man. He and his wife were planning the division of property and discussing property rights, or excuse me, custody rights, over their children. Divorce was imminent. One afternoon, the man found a book in his personal library. The unabridged version of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. The man had no idea where he got the book, but he felt as if he's always wanted to read it. So, he read. The book contained the story of a fictional bishop, Monsignor Bienvenu. Monsignor Bienvenu loved our Lord, and he loved those around him. He lived a life of complete generosity. Everything he received, stipends, a bishop's mansion, gifts, he lovingly gave away. As the man read about the life of this fictional saint, a thought came into his mind. 
I have given you everything. A beautiful wife, two daughters, a career, a house. Why are you throwing it all away? This thought stuck with the man for days. Finally, the man realized how far he had retreated behind his walls. And for the first time in years, he began to pray. Lord, I've really messed things up. Please help me. He prayed this way for a year until out of the blue, he was unexpectedly transferred to a new assignment with his office. An assignment located in a building across the street from here, the cathedral. Walking into work one morning, the man noticed that statue right across the parkway there, or across the plaza. The statue above the bronze door, Our Lady of the Angels, inviting, welcoming all to enter. He thought, I had to go back to Mass. At about that time, the man was assigned to do a special project that required him to travel two days a week to Lancaster. As a teenager, the man had spent many retreats at a Catholic abbey near Lancaster. Some of you may know it, St. Andrew's Abbey. The man took the locations of his new assignment and new project as no coincidence and decided to attend Mass every day at the cathedral or at St. Andrew's Abbey. Being at Mass again stirred deep feelings of how things used to be in his life. The man felt our Lord calling him to a spiritual renewal, and he began to seriously focus on his journey. He read about spiritual matters and befriended a visiting priest at the cathedral. In his spiritual reading, uh, the man heard about something called a spiritual director. And given his spiritual renewal, he asked this new priest friend if he would be a spiritual director. He told the priest that he specifically needed a spiritual director who could deal with the aggressive personality of an attorney. That's kind of a joke. <laughs> he actually did. The person told the man, he would, the priest told the man he would think about it. A week later, the priest contacted the man. The priest had prayed about it, but he had to decline because he was too busy. The man understood and was embarrassed to have even asked. The priest told the man, that he should contact the Jesuits at Loyola Marymount University. The main problem with this suggestion, or the main problems, were first, the man did not know any Jesuits. And second, the man had never set foot on the Loyola Marymount campus. At this point, the man was too embarrassed to tell the priest that his advice seemed like a dead end. That Friday, the man ended up working late at his office. One of his colleagues, a devout Christian woman, was also working late at the office. The man ended up in her office telling her about his journey and how he had reached a dead end. She offered the man the following sage. God never closes a door without opening a window. That night, on the way home, the man prayed. Lord, I know you've placed me close to the cathedral and sent me to St. Andrew's Abbey. I have attended Mass every day. I thank you for the spiritual renewal, but I think I need a spiritual director, and I do not know any Jesuits so you need to show me a sign. I'm not challenging you. In your time, show me a sign. The next morning, the man went to buy breakfast for his family at a local restaurant. As the man exited his car, he noticed a homeless man next to the door of the restaurant. Seeing the homeless person, the man was reminded of one of the homilies given by Cardinal Mahoney at the cathedral. And since this is being taped, I'd like to just interrupt this with an aside. Uh, that Cardinal Mahoney, when he is out at the 7 a.m. Mass, is just like the local parish priest. And let me tell you, some of the best homilies he's ever given were at that 7 a.m. Mass. That's my personal aside. <laughs> the homily that the Cardinal gave that morning concerned a gospel reading from Luke, the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The Cardinal explained that the rich man had not done anything affirmatively wrong to Lazarus. He had not beaten Lazarus or evicted him from his property. The sin of the rich man was not being attentive to Lazarus as a human being. During the homily, the cardinal issued a challenge. The next time a homeless person asks you for money, you may not give him any, but at least ask his name. At least acknowledge him as a human being. And then maybe find something to eat. So as the man approached the restaurant's entrance, the homeless person asked him for a dollar. The man told the homeless person that he would buy him something to eat. The homeless person asked if he could come inside the restaurant 
and the man invited him in. They ordered some food and sat at a booth for a while. And again, inspired by the homily, the man introduced himself and asked the homeless person's name. The homeless person said he was David. And he asked the man what his occupation was. The man told David that he was an attorney for the county. And just then a thought came to the man's mind. Ask him what he does for work. The man thought to himself, I can't ask a homeless person what he does for work. That would be cold. The thought came again more forcefully. Ask him what he does for work. The man inquired hesitantly. So, David, what do you do for work? Well, I used to work around here, but for a long time, I worked in Lancaster, David replied. The man said, really? Just outside of Lancaster, there's a little town called Little Rock. I know Little Rock, David said. Do you know a little Catholic abbey up there called St. Andrew's Abbey? Mm -hmm. Chuckling, David replied, of course I do. My brother is a Jesuit priest. <laughs> <laughs> Stunned, the man asked, where? At Loyola Mary Mountain University. <laughs> Hesitating, the man asked, David, will you do me a favor? Can I contact your brother? David told the man to contact his brother and to give his brother a message from him. And as if purposefully, he spelled out his brother's name letter by letter. The man returned home and immediately looked at the online directory for LMU. The brother was not there. But David had made it a point to spell out the name letter by letter. So the man decided to run an internet search with that name. Sure enough, several articles came back. They told of a Jesuit priest who had been transferred to a new position at the university. He had formerly been the chaplain of, the Los of a Los Angeles law school and had one time appeared on a popular television show. On that television show, he had played a Jesuit priest himself who had been called in to the hospital to counsel a couple who had lost their child when he was born prematurely and died. <clears throat> the man called the priest. The priest found the man, the spiritual director, and the man's life will never be the same. God shots, what are they? That book, that thought, that unexpected job transfer, that answer to a prayer, that coworker's wisdom, that homily's challenge, those constant penetrations of our walls, moments when even for a split second, we are aware of God's presence in our lives and his infinite love for each of us. And then, sometimes, when we are ready, that experience, when you know to your core that the Holy One, the risen Christ, this tremendous lover, has intervened in your life, tearing down your walls and revealing himself to you in such a way that there is no turning back. Now, brothers and sisters, although this story took place during Lent three years ago, this story is not a Lenten story, but an Easter story. So what happened? Where is this man now? Some of you have probably already guessed or have already heard this story before, so you already know. I'm happy to report that I've been under the spiritual direction of a Jesuit at LMU for three years. My marriage is stronger than ever. My career continues to evolve in positive ways. And most importantly, and by his grace, I have opened a window to our Lord and his God shots. Thank you for listening. Peace be with you.